Good morning. Welcome everyone. Welcome old friends and new friends and first time visitors. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, welcome to First Unitarian Church. I'm Angela Herrera, the senior minister here. I'm joined this morning by our associate minister, Bob Lavalli, by music director, Susan Peck, lay leader, Raven Reed Starr, Dan Small is our volunteer DJ this morning. And of course, we depend on our technical arts director, Chris Paul, and a whole team of volunteers every week. Church is a community effort at First Unitarian. And we are so glad to be together with all of you today. As we begin, Raven has some announcements to share. Good morning. This Wednesday, December 9th, you are invited to the Blue December service. This is an annual service that is especially for anyone who may be experiencing sadness or a sense of loss during the holidays. All are welcome. The service is Wednesday at 7 p.m. Our usher will put the meeting number in the chat box for you. And later this month, we'll be doing our annual Las Posadas Christmas Eve pageant over Zoom, but everyone is still welcome to participate. We'll be reading the story aloud, and we need visuals to go with the story. Visuals can be drawings or stage photographs that portray a part of the story. These include Mary, Joseph, or the donkey, the travelers looking for a place to stay, shepherds, angels, stars, royalty, and farm animals, an inn, a manger, and the traveler's road, or any other images that suit the story. Send your images to cpaul at uuabq.org and thanks in advance. In a moment, we'll light our chalices and candles. First, we'd like to share a special pastoral message from the national president of our denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association. Here is the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. Greetings Unitarian Universalists. For so many reasons, this holiday season is different than any in memory. Dearly held traditions that bring us joy are pared down, virtual, or canceled altogether. Many of us are tired and grieving. We have lost too many loved ones this year, elders, mentors, family, friends. This is true in our personal lives, it is true in our congregations, and it is true for our faith as a whole. And grief always weighs heavier in the holidays, especially in a year such as this. One of the things that is keeping me grounded these days is remembering to stay in the present rather than dwelling on what cannot be. I welcome grief, yes. I welcome the emotions present in my heart and in my life, yes. And and I stay present and open to what is before me today. The gift of sky, of sun, of earth, of stars, of life, of friends and loved ones. It is a challenge to shift my perspective away from what is missing. But when I do, when I'm able to stay in the present and let go of longing for what has been in the past, I find that there is a powerful yes waiting in this moment, a yes in, the, in a year full of negation and despair and affirmation that the world is calling forth from us in this great season of turning, in this season of generosity and goodwill and peace. There is a yes. 
May we in this season, unlike any before, invite gratitude for the gifts that have emerged and continue to be present this year. We witness what can happen when people help one another and prioritize community over the self. We have become connected in ways new and different ways that have allowed more people to connect to community and ministry. And at a time that has presented profound challenges, our communities have grown strong in both spirit and in faith. Instead of focusing on what cannot be, may we create new practices of gratitude and meaning that reflect the generosity, the humanity, and the compassion that are needed in our world today and that are needed to foster more love and more justice for the future. And may we also, may all of you, each of you, may we all find time to slow down this season and set aside the pressure and hecticness that is so often a part of the holidays that has never been particularly helpful. So this year, when so much has been asked of us again and again, we all need and deserve rest. May you have rest this season. As I sit in the beautiful darkness of this season, I am reminded that life is nurtured in darkness, that seeds take root in the darkness of the soil, that babies are formed in the dark of the womb. The world is asking something new of us and something new can be born from this time. And as we light candles, like we always do in this season, in ritual and celebration, let us embrace the mystery and the possibility of this very special time. In this season, I send you my love, my prayers, my care, and so many, many blessings to each and every one of you. I've had the opportunity to get to know Susan Frederick Gray over the last few years at an annual retreat. And I know that her warmth and care are genuine. Under her leadership, the UUA has provided really important resources and guidance to congregations during the pandemic. They've provided logistical help, moral support, help understanding our role as employers during a complex relief bill time. We at First Unitarian also turned to the UUA for our search for an associate minister last year, and we're doing so again now as we search for our next ministerial intern. Yes, we will have another ministerial intern. And the UUA gives UUs a national voice in social justice and partners with other organizations like Black Lives Matter. I mention all these things right now because we need each other more than ever right now as individuals and as communities. And because the UUA is one of the important things in our annual operating budget, we, help fund the UUA with the financial pledges that we each make to this church. And we're getting very close to our goal, but we're not there yet for our pledges that we need for 2021. So if you have not filled out a pledge form on the church website yet, I hope you'll consider doing it today. And if you have filled one out, thank you so much. This is just one of the ways that every pledge counts. All right, all across the country this morning, you use our lighting chalices and candles. Let's light ours now too. And I'm going to borrow Susan Frederick Gray's words. For the gift of sky, of sun, of earth, of stars, for the mystery and the possibility, we kindle these flames.
Good morning. Will you please join me in singing our opening song? This is a beautiful Advent carol, People Look East. And the words are by Eleanor Farjohn, who is the same person who wrote Morning Has Broken. It was a lovely hymn. The words are in your chat box, and I will play through the whole melody once before we sing. circle around everybody and I'm going to tell you a story about when the sun was born again. So it was the middle of winter and the sun had grown very old. All year long the sun had worked very hard rising and setting day after day. All year long the sun had fed everybody on earth shining and shining giving energy to the trees and the flowers and the grasses so they could grow and feed the animals and birds and insects and people. All year, the sun's gravity held tight to the spinning ball of the earth and the twirling ball of the moon and the eight other whirling planets as they traveled around and around until the poor sun was dizzy watching it all. Now the poor tired sun could barely make it up in the morning. And after a very short time, needed to sleep again. So the days grew shorter and the nights grew longer until the day was so short, it was hardly worth getting up for. Night felt sorry for the sun. Come to my arms and rest, child, she said. After all, I am your mother. You were born out of my darkness billions of years ago, and you will return to me when all things end. Let me cradle you now as I shelter every galaxy and star in the universe. So night wrapped her great arms around the sun, and the night was very long indeed. Why does the dark go on so long, asked children all over Earth. Won't the sun ever come back again? The sun is very tired, the old one said. But maybe 
If you children say thank you for all the things the sun does for us, the light may return in the morning. The children sang songs to the sun. They thought about all the things the sun gave them. Can you think of things that the sun gives us? Uh-oh, I'm about to sneeze. I'll keep going, though. Oh, nope. I hope everyone was thinking about what the sun gave them while I was sneezing. <laughs> Anyways, the children said, thank you for growing the lettuces and the corn and the rice and the wheat. Thank you for growing the trees of the forest and the seaweed and the oceans and the krill that feeds the whales. Thank you for stirring the air and making winds that bring rain. Every time a child said thank you, the sun began to feel a little warmer, a little brighter. Wrapped safely in the arms of night, the sun grew younger and younger. At last, the children had to go to bed. We will stay up and wait for the sun to rise again, the old one said. Can't we stay up too, the children asked. You can try, but you will get too sleepy, the old one said but you can each light a candle because all fire is a spark of the sun's fire. Put your candle in a very safe place and let it keep vigil for you as you sleep and dream of sunrise. So the children lit their candles and put them in very safe places and each flame was a little spark of the sun's fire. And the sun peeped out from between the arms of night and saw all the little fires and began to feel warmer and brighter and younger still. Early in the morning, the old ones woke the children. Together they climbed a high hill and faced to the east, the direction of sunrise. They sang songs to the sun and ran around trying to keep warm. They waited and waited to see what dawn would bring. The sky began to turn from black to indigo to blue. Slowly the sky grew light and a golden glow crept over the horizon. Night opened her great arms and in a burst of brightness, the sun appeared, new and strong and shining. For in that long night, the sun had rested well and grown young from the songs and the thanks of the children. Young as a brand new baby, born out of night once more. Everyone cheered and the children jumped up and down. The sun has returned, the sun is reborn, the people cried. And they danced and sang to celebrate the birth of the day and then went home to breakfast. The end. That was Rebirth of the Sun by Starhawk and Diane Baker and Anne Hill. Let's pause the chat for a few moments during our meditation and prayer. We'll turn it on during the joys and concerns portion. And as we move into meditation, I wanna share a breath meditation by Reverend Samuel A. Trumbor. So find a comfortable seat, let yourself be soft, and let us turn inward now. Feel the rhythm of the breath, in and out, in and out. Find the peace of just being with the flow of the breath, letting go of yesterday, and tomorrow, feel the restorative power of the peace of this moment. A peace large enough to open to the concerns and sorrows that trouble us. A stillness quiet enough to respond to the joys and celebrations that enliven us. 
there is safety here in the rhythm of the breath. The ebb and flow of life, of life is enacted in each one. Taking in oxygen sustenance, letting go of carbon dioxide waste, taking in the fullness of experience, letting go of the residue that wants to cling to us. Cultivate inner peace and inner safety in this sanctuary dedicated to cultivating the spirit of life. Dedicated to being a beacon of love for all beings. Let's sit together in two minutes of silence. We come to our time of sharing joys and concerns. Sharing either our joys or concerns together gives us an opportunity to support one another. Please use the chat bar for this sharing. If you are not able to write in the chat bar, please contact the church office or send an email to caring at uuabq.org. Please first share your joys followed by your concerns as prompted on your screen. Breathe by 
set aside And I'll open wide Oh wind, come fill me with you journey with each other as we share joys and concerns. So many joys for the sun and nature and birds and the company of family and friends and the presence of love, the presence of love that is always around us. And we see concerns. We see concerns for the pandemic and the isolation and loneliness it causes and the hurting world. And we think of Bill Miller's friend, Karen, who is struggling with cancer. And we think of all the unhoused now. And we remember Kay Kaler's father who just passed. May light perpetual shine upon him. All these things we lift up to the great powers of healing and renewal that are known by many names. Will you join me in prayer? We pray today with the words of Reverend Laura, Laura Horton Ludwig. As a people of faith, we seek to live in a spirit of love, a spirit of community, justice, and peace. And yet, in so many corners of the world, both far and near, we see divisiveness and hate. If we look deep within ourselves, perhaps even we find these shadow energies there too. We struggle to respond to the outer world and our inner dramas in ways that manifest love. At times, we may fear that love will not be strong enough. At times, we may question whether love is really at the root of all things in this world with so much suffering and struggle and discord. We may struggle to hold on to our faith in love, knowing that if all things come from one, the one source we proclaim, that source must somehow hold hate as well as love, violence as well as peace, evil as well as good. This is the mystery within which we live and die. These are the questions that haunt our days and nights. And yet we are not without hope. Our struggles and our questions testify to our longing for peace, for love. Our very longings are born out of that mystery 
that we dare to address as spirit of life and love in the stillness and silence of our own heart we read the imprint of love created not by our own will but planted there for us to discover by what or whom we cannot know and yet it is there a clue a talisman a beacon, a light within. May it keep hope alive even as we dwell in mystery. May it guide us all as we seek to wise, as we seek to act wisely and well. May it help us to be vessels of compassion for one another and for our world. Amen. And peace be with you. Still, 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 to to Silence from Sonata for Voice and Silence by the Reverend Mark Bellatini. You, Silence, are the ground on which we build the fragile sand castles of our every spoken word. You, Silence, are quicksand where curses and cockiness and arrogance find their end. You, Silence, are the strand of beach we stroll where loneliness turns into solitude and our small heartbeats join the much vaster heartbeat of tide and wave. You silence are the hand in which the pearl of the universe grown around the painful grain of human suffering rests in heartbreaking beauty. You silence are the wide bright delta into which the river of this prayer fans out before it flows into the indigo deep, quiet, dark, and lovely. Come, silence, fill this moment. The other day, as I was reflecting on this month's new theological theme of stillness, I came across a story about the contemporary hermit movement. The contemporary hermit movement. That sounds almost like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? Maybe even two contradictions. Contemporary hermit, hermit movement. I think my earliest impression of what a hermit is must have come from an episode of the Smurfs. Remember the Smurfs? 
I sure do. I got called Smurf a lot when I was a little kid. Ha ha, very funny. If you've only ever attended First Unitarian Church on Zoom, that's gonna make a lot more sense to you later on when we meet in person. On the Smurfs, hermits are portrayed as unhappy people who don't like other humans. Other cartoons and shows gave a similar impression, I think. And not just that hermits are grumpy, but that they're uh, old fashioned, like relics from a past era, and they live out in the woods and that they never leave their houses. I think that's the impression some of us still have. So the idea of a contemporary hermit or hermits cooperating in a movement might seem surprising, but as is often the case when it comes to our impressions of other people, there's the stereotype society comes up with, and then there's what's true. The word hermit is an old word. It comes from the Greek word eremia, which means desert. Eremitis or hermit was the name given to some of the early Christians who lived in the first few hundred years after Jesus. They moved to remote places in the desert, far from any village or city. And their lives of solitude weren't about disliking other people, but about removing distractions so that they could devote themselves to the life of the spirit. That tradition continued with the practice of monasticism. There's a song we've heard at church a lot this year, All Will Be Well. It was the closing song for the first couple of months after the pandemic began. That song was written by a UU minister, Meg Barnhouse, but it's based on the words of a woman who lived in the 1300s, Julian of Norwich. Julian of Norwich lived an eremitic or hermit life, and she actually lived right in the middle of a busy town, but she did so as an anchorite. That means she was near people, but secluded from them. Kind of like a lot of us feel now. She lived in a little room or a cell with the door actually sealed shut. Anchorite sounds like anchor. The two words are not related, but she certainly stayed in place. Julian lived through the Black Death or the bubonic plague and huge social unrest. Based on her writings, which are filled with references to mothering and birth and which compare God to a nursing mother, some scholars believe that Julian herself was a mother who lost her family to the plague before becoming a hermit. And so it's all the more remarkable that in her life of stillness and prayer, she developed a profound faith in the ultimate goodness of the universe. She believed that love is the ultimate force and that no matter our losses and traumas, we are ultimately held in that love. In a vision, she heard these words flow to her from the source of all being. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That's why we have that song. Words spoken to us by an ancestor from a life of stillness and pandemic and loss and love. There have always been people in every culture and every religion who chose a life of intentional solitude. Today, hermit is still a word to describe somebody who lives alone for spiritual reasons, but among contemporary hermits, that spirituality may not be attached to any particular religion. Hermits are people who practice stillness. This is stillness in the sense of an absence of disturbance, a lifestyle of stillness that then nurtures an inner stillness. It doesn't mean hermits don't move or never speak with others, but it's a lifestyle that's noticeably still and quiet and distant socially. And because of this, they may have some wisdom for the rest of us right now. Two contemporary hermits, a married couple named Paul Fredette and Karen Carper Fredette noticed that visits to their website about their life of solitude had gone from 800 per day to 2000 per day since the beginning of the pandemic. Now, some of those visitors may have decided that they no longer like other humans. Maybe they were ready to smirk on out of society, right? 
Maybe they just saw one too many news stories about yet another person losing their ever loving mind after being asked to wear a mask. But it seems like most were looking for some guidance about how to do this, how to live a life of simplicity and isolation. So the Fredettes reached out. They started a YouTube channel. See, very contemporary. And their gentle video messages, they offer encouragement. They share inspiring quotes like one you may have heard before about how when you come to the edge of what you know and you must take a step into the unknown, you must believe that one of two things will happen. Either there will be something solid to step on or you will be taught to fly. And they encourage people who are experiencing isolation in a simplified life to do two things, go inward and get outside. Now, before I go any further, I think it's important to mention that not everybody is experiencing increased alone time as a result of social distancing. If you have children whose schools are closed, for example, you probably have way less alone time than before. And some people, like healthcare workers, might be experiencing a faster pace and longer hours in their jobs. We are not all having the same experience. And yet, there is a reduction in activity. We're not going out after work to burn off steam and relax anymore. And if you have children at home, I'll bet you've heard the phrase, I'm bored so many times this year that if you hear it one more time, you are going to, well, that phrase is a reaction to stillness, isn't it? To the discomfort it can cause in us. Not just kids, grownups feel bored too. We can give our children and ourselves the gift of learning to notice times of stillness and quiet, not as the absence of fun or as stops on the way to the next active thing, but as something valuable. What we need is a little JOMO. JOMO is the joy of missing out. You heard of FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. JOMO is the opposite of that. We're missing out on many of our regular activities and our social connections the joy of that is the opportunity to experience stillness by going inward and by going outside. Aren't those contradictory, you ask? How can you experience stillness while going outside? I think of the poet, the poet Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver was not a hermit, but she was certainly a contemplative person. And she is someone who spent time in stillness. I think every Mary Oliver poem I've ever read has included going inward and going outside. In one called 5 a.m. in the pine woods, she follows some hoof prints into the woods and she finds herself gazing into the eyes of two animals that stare from under their thick lashes. She is so still and present, it seems like one of them will come right into her arms. After they leave, she writes, so this is how you swim inward. So this is how you flow outward. So this is how you pray. December is the time of year most associated with stillness. The natural world is quieter as the nights stretch to their longest length and plants and animals rest. It invites us also into more quiet, more stillness, more rest. It's a sacred time. In another poem, Mary Oliver calls stillness one of the doors into the temple. It's one of the doors into the temple. What does that mean? What is spirituality? What is this temple in its most basic sense? It's the depth of our lives. Our lives have breadth, right? The way that we move across our lives doing things and they have depth. The part where we experience our innermost selves and thoughts, our understanding of who we are and what we are and what our lives mean to us. That may include a sense of God or it may not, but spirituality is the depth aspect of life. 
when we spend time in stillness, we're close to that depth. Spending time with it nurtures it. What's so uncomfortable about that? What is with all of this I'm bored and all of these impulses we have to pick up our phones or turn on the television or start snacking or all three, right? What happens when we get still? The other day I was resting. I was just being still and my mind wandered. I wasn't even really particularly aware of it happening. And that's monkey mind, as the Buddhists say. Our minds go chasing after distractions, even when our hands don't. In meditation, when we notice our minds doing this, we just gently bring them back to the present. After a little while, I did bring my mind back to the present, and that's when I noticed that my hand was doing this. This is a protective gesture, right? I had been having negative, worrying thoughts. I can't even remember about what now. Like, take your pick, right? It's 2020. That's one of the reasons we avoid stillness. It brings a lot of stuff up to the surface. Thoughts we've been keeping at bay. What comes up might be our fears and anxiety or trauma. We may experience regret or shame or negative self-talk. Worries and negative thoughts aren't created by the stillness. They just rise to our awareness in the stillness. They bubble up and it's okay. That gives us a chance to acknowledge them. There might be valuable information in there for you. Maybe you know something that you haven't been ready to face yet, but now it's time to make a change. Other thoughts might be garbage. I'm serious, you don't have to believe everything you think, right? Like you can just let those negative self thoughts float up and just float right on away, don't need them. More interesting though, are your fears and your regrets, which can tell you what's most valuable to you so that you can assess whether you are giving it the priority it deserves. Or maybe you have some spiritual work to do in order to be able to to peacefully coexist with your fears. Maybe you start with the body, moving your hand from your face or wherever your anxious hand might go and maybe putting it on your shoulder like this. I invite you to try this with me. This is a comforting self grip. You can put your hand on your shoulder and you can even put your, your other one behind your elbow like this. Take a breath see what that feels like. Just as our bodies send us messages that we notice when we are still, we can send our bodies messages back. This one says, you're safe. I've got this. Your dreams and your longings are powerful and they arise in stillness too. They can help shape your future. In this way, stillness helps us begin to live from the inside out instead of always reacting and holding things back. Another thing that happens is that once we've surfaced all the stuff we've been holding at bay, once we acknowledge it and either we embrace it or we let it go, then it gets quieter and more still within us. Stillness outside begins to be mirrored by stillness inside. And that still depth in us, that becomes a place of peace. Life does what it does. But if we have nurtured that stillness within us, we will have peace within us. Imagine the way the surface of the ocean can be rough and stormy, but below, there's stillness and depth. It's like that. In our reading this morning, Mark Bellatini writes, you silence are the strand of beach we stroll where loneliness turns into solitude and our small heartbeats join the much vaster heartbeat of tide and wave. May your heartbeats be like that 
and may peace be profound within you. And in this season of sacred dark, may you find rest. Our Change for the Future recipient this quarter is SAGE. SAGE provides support for older LGBT people in the Albuquerque metropolitan area through advocacy, social programs, education, support groups, and resource distribution. We counter isolation, fear, and loneliness by creating a caring community of LGBT elders who will look out for each other. You can make an offering online by clicking on the link that we will put in the chat box. And if you prefer not to give online, you can always simply mail a check to the church. Last week, we asked folks during worship to share one word for the coming year. Our tech art director, Chris Paul, has formed these into a dove meditation that we'll be sharing during our offertory for the rest of the holiday season. Let us now exercise the enduring power of generosity. generously given is received with gratitude. Thank you on behalf of First Unitarian and thank you on behalf of Sage. As we move towards the end of our worship service, we'll be offering opportunity for folks to spend a little time together in breakout rooms. And I wanna invite you while you're in your room, here's a, discuss a discussion question. How have you simplified your life lately? I'm gonna put that in the chat. How have you simplified your life lately. And now we extinguish our candles and chalices, but we carry with us the light of love. 
Go in peace, friends, and may love bless you and keep you until we're gathered again. Blessed be.